So I took a break from painting, and when I came back, I decided that the shoreline was was too low in the painting, so I needed to modify that. It was especially true since there's also a uh, line that's running vertically through the painting as well with the edge of the, the trees. So it became really critical not to um, get those two very important lines to intersect at the midway point of the canvas. So I very carefully took my palette knife and, ver and scraped the colors off. Now I'm just adding it back onto my palette as you can see here. So that's a good way to you know, accumulate some nice grays as, as you just scrape the canvas. So I'm picking up, you can't see it here, but I'm off camera, I'm picking up some blues that I mixed. These blues and greens are just blues and greens that I mixed to, to uh, paint the trees. So I've just added more darker color um, into it to keep the reflected light darker than the, the light from above. So every time uh, the light reflects off the water, it'll be a little bit lower in value. So um, now the, the paint I'm painting over is is fairly thin, so I'm using enough paint that I can just kind of obliterate right, right over the top. Now if the paint is too thick, then it's going to start mixing in a little bit. And it doesn't matter if a little bit mixes in because that just gives a little bit more variety to that color mass. So that's not a problem. You can see here that I've added some of the reflected uh, color from the distant mountain in there. And, it, and I'm adding it, and it's a little warmer than the previous color. And that's fine. It just, you know, uh, everything sort of adds the complexity. And if you try to simplify too much, you get very kind of monotonous masses of color. And that's not good. So one of the hallmarks of broken color, vibrating color, is that there are a lot of different colors in that stroke. So the enemy of broken color is overmixing, you know, getting your color too flat and being a little too fastidious in trying to even out color. Like I could the stroke I'm laying in right now, if I just if I just kept stroking that over and over again to try to mix it perfectly then I lose all the little bits of broken color. So you don't want to do that. You want to try to relax and just let those accidental bits of color just happen. So you have to practice quite a bit in order to have that level of confidence and relaxation. One thing to note in the reflection is that the colors are are simplified. I mean, I'm not having as much broken color in the reflection as I do in the the uh, distant trees and the distant mountains. And the reason for that is the water has that that um, quality that sort of simplifies things, and it, it you might say it sort of makes things blurry. That's not a, a really great description, but in a sense, it's sort of averaging all the colors together. So. If I painted it um, very accurately, it would make the water look like there was no movement in the water at all. And that's not really the effect I'm trying for here. I want there to be some energy and motion in that um, surface. So making it a perfect mirror surface and painting it almost with the same level of detail as there is in the upper half of the canvas would make that appear like the water is very, very motionless, very, very flat. So I try not to get too fastidious about my strokes when I'm in the water, painting the water. The main thing is to try to keep the lines moving in, in a logical fashion. You'll see here I'm not using a lot of vertical lines. I mean, initially when I laid in the reflection of the, the distant poplar, you know, I did use you know, a vertical line, but most of my motion, most of my, the motion of my hand as I put on paint is very horizontal. And that's because that's the way the ripples would, would react in the paint. So 
Um, you know, you, you, you don't want to make hard and fast rules, but um, generally speaking, you uh, want those energy lines to be going horizontally. So I decided that I needed a little bit more variety on that edge of the reflected mountain. So I'm going to put in a little bit more lighter color a little, and I'm, I'm mixing in some pinks and I'm, I'm not getting concerned about picking up some of the pink of that reflected mountain and dragging it into the section below. So now I, I went onto my palette and I just picked up some warmer blues. Uh, typically the blue will get warmer as it approaches the horizon and it'll be cooler towards the, the, the zenith or the high point of the horizon you know right above you so uh, I'm trying to keep that a nice interplay of warm and cool in the sky if I painted the sky with the same uniformity of temperature from top to bottom it would look very flat even though there was a modulation of value so that that's a good rule of thumb is that you can try to keep your values shifting across a, a spot of color and keep your temperature shifting as well the 19th century art critic john ruskin uh, felt that the best way to get motion into a landscape was to be sure that every color was shifting in some way either in value or temperature hue or both or all those um, factors I have mentioned or blending you know quite a few times and it just is one of the hazards um, and there really is no solution to it except to practice and to try to just relax sometimes people will I was, you just noticed there I was kind of doing some vertical blending and that sort of helped to pull that shadow and, and pull that reflection in, into the deeper section of the water. So I felt like that water along the, the shoreline was just a little too light and so I needed to break that up. And I'm, I'm trying to emphasize some of the dark spots of the scene above it so that the darkness in the, sh in the reflection reflects the dark sh uh, shapes in the scene above but um, sometimes you'll see a, a, a painter that's just sort of thrashing away on their on their um, canvas and they, they they're not really sure what they're trying to do they're just frustrated and so they're you know repetitively stroking the canvas and that of course leads to very dull color so you know whatever you want to whatever you do you don't want to just sit and scrub on your canvas so if you're not sure where you want to go just you know take a deep breath and stop and and take a look at what's going on and just you know wait uh, until you decide what you want to do uh, one of the nice things about oils is that it doesn't dry quickly and you have a lot of time to make a decision as to you know where you want to make your adjustments so um, that's always you know a you know very re reassuring aspect of oil painting so I um, frequently just stop painting and I step back from my canvas and I try to say what what's wrong with this canvas what needs to be fixed you know what can I do to improve it so then I have a very logical idea of how to proceed forward and I, and I'm just not sort of nervously uh, scrubbing away on my canvas. So you'll notice that I do have some variation of color that are, is representative of the scene above in, in the reflection, but not every detail is represented. So that kind of simplification is, uh, will actually add more reality to your scene. I think, you know, it's more um, indicative of how reality is. Now I did um, sort of lose track of my filming a little bit and I we kind of jumped forward here a bit and um, I apologize for that. Sometimes I just get a little bit too focused on what I'm doing painting wise and I forget to film but I just put some dashes of white into the, the foreground in the water 
and that's just representative of little ripples, little undulations in the water that are picking up the very lightest part of the sky. It's not picking up the sky immediately above our heads, but it's picking up sky closer to the horizon. So this is the kind of um, undulation you get in water when there's a little bit of wind hitting the water, or perhaps there's just a slight current that's causing that to ripple. Perhaps there's a, you know, a sandbar just, you know, a few feet underneath the water. So, um, and then these, these longer dashes I'm using for the same effect, but they're more a simplified version of the dashes. So in the distance, all these dashes that are in the foreground will be represented as just a lighter, a lighter section of, of the water. Now, what I'm adding right now is a very blue version of white. So that would be representative of water that's picking up um, sky that's just a little bit higher above our heads. So every time that water surface shifts, it's going to pick up a different lightness or darkness of sky color. So um, once you realize you know how that works, it's fairly easy to replicate. But there's a lot, you know, you, people make a lot of mistakes as well. But um, if you spend a lot of time sketching outdoors, that's helpful. And, you know, I love to be on the water and by water. So whenever I am, I, I try to, to make a note of, of how the light is bouncing off the water. If all else fails, you can resort to photographs. And there's always the internet where you can find ample resources to um, study reflections.